Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar on natural dams. I'm your host, Craig Price with Surface Water Solutions. I'll be joined today by Chris Goodell from Kleinschmidt Associates. And we will be discussing a couple of things in the geological past, a few things going on right now and looking into the future um, for natural dams and the risks that they present in our world today. So looking at our world today, let's uh, have a look at the attendees, uh, very heavily focused there on Australia on the East Coast, but uh, spread around the world as well. Welcome to everybody attending live for this session and also to those who will be watching this recording later on. So we'd like to introduce to you today, uh, Chris Goodell, who has been on our presentations uh, on the Australia Water School a number of times, and um, we are pleased to have Chris with us today. Chris, if you can say hi, uh, you're coming to us from uh, Portland today. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm coming from the west coast of the uh, United States, specifically up in Portland, Oregon. So just want to say hello and welcome, and hopefully we can uh, share some interesting stuff today for everybody. Yeah, thanks, Chris and I have been working together for a while uh, doing training courses for hydraulic modeling and uh, yeah, just excited to have uh, Chris back on. Um, thank you to those who filled out the poll questions. That'll give us a feel for um, who's on board today and uh, what sector you're coming to us from. As usual, uh, commercial and consulting tends to come out on top, uh, but what I'm interested in for today's discussion uh, is whether anybody's actually done any modeling of these kind of events. So we're going to be discussing natural dam failures. Um, Chris and I are both hydraulic modelers. So the question is, has anybody actually uh, modeled these? And uh, 10%, uh, I guess that's about what I was expecting for landslide dams and GLOFs, um, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, glacial lake out outburst flood, um, looks like 3%. So that's awesome though, uh, at least a few of you have, but um, hopefully you'll see some, uh, some of the models that we've put together that you'd be able to uh, have a look at today. And maybe you'll uh, want to model some of these on your own. So final question on the polls was uh, whether you expect climate change to affect GLOFs going forward. Would the risk um, and the consequences of a GLOF um, increase, uh, decrease both unchanged or don't know? So most would expect it to increase. Chris, um, any comments on that? We had a little discussion earlier about um, how it's kind of a loaded question. It uh, could go could go two ways. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the obvious answer is it would increase if you know the, the uh, climate's getting warmer and glaciers are uh, becoming less stable. But what happens when it gets warm enough and they all go away? Then, <laughs> so and in, in that way, I guess we'd have less gloss. Um, so uh, hopefully that will never come to be. But um, but yeah, it's another way of looking at it, I suppose. Sounds good. Okay, well, the way this is going to work then today, um, I'm going to kind of introduce the topic, um, some definitions, um, hit a couple of historical geological scale events. Um, and then Chris has got a really cool presentation um, that we've got some links to um, that he's going to be um, sharing a kind of a summary of for us um, on the Missoula floods. Um, and then I'll come back and uh, mention a few things um, that are ongoing today, um, research that we're looking forward to um, uh, that, that can help save Save lives, really, in the future. That's what it's about. Um, there is a risk. These natural dams that uh, can form randomly uh, after an earthquake or uh, predictably uh, when you get climate change uh, melting the snow and containing ice dams and getting them to, uh, you know, when populations live downstream, you know, what we do and when we model these things and how we look at these and how we assess them and monitor them, uh, it can save lives. Okay, so with that, uh, let me kick off uh, this presentation then. Um, we are talking about natural dam failures, past, present, and future. We've got a couple of examples here that we're going to get into. This is uh, shown here in uh, New Zealand. But what I want to show you uh, right from the very start, um, which I'll highlight at the end, is a website that I've set up where I've put bunch of the resources that we're going to talk about today. Um, I've listed as many papers as I could in here. We've probably got uh, 100 or 200 different examples of natural dams that are all really cool that we could have highlighted today. But in the interest of time, we'll just pick five or six of them uh, to show you and then leave you to your own research. Um, and uh, this is kind of a compilation of resources that you can use. Natural dams, let's kind of define those. Um, a dam, if we look at Merriam-Webster, is uh, just a barrier preventing the flow of water. 
water. So a natural dam and a natural dam failure could be a number of different things. We've got landslide dams, which uh, well, we'll, we'll show you some examples of, ice dams, moraine dams, which are kind of related to the glaciers as well, lahar or volcanic uh, activity that uh, can dam up water, and then really an alluvial fan, the avulsion, when, when something avulses, a creek avulses, that's basically uh, an impediment to the water. So that could be a dam as well. We're not just limited to, uh, to our planet. Um, we've got some here on Mars uh, as well. I can't think of any that uh, where, where there were catastrophic dam failures, like from landslides or anything like that. But technically, if you look at um, Wikipedia's definition of a dam, it includes subsurface water as well. And so um, up on Mars, uh, there were some groundwater barriers that uh, capped it and put it under pressure, and that exploded out into some of these uh, floods that created canyons uh, far larger than the Grand Canyon, um, and probably floods larger than anything we've ever seen on Earth. Got some links to some of that uh, the interplanetary fluvial geomorphology on that website. Back here on Earth, though, looking at some landslide dams, um, the largest, I think the deepest lake, at least in uh, the North Island of New Zealand, um, is a landslide dam that has just stabilized in place, basically. And that was 2000 years ago, I think. Um, but uh, more recently, I think in 1911, there's a landslide dam that formed Ceres Lake, which I think um, it was about, I think I read it was 570 meters high, so higher than any dam uh, that's been constructed in the world. And imagine if that were to fail. Luckily, it's kind of stabilized uh, with a stable outlet, but but imagine uh, the catastrophe that would happen if something that size uh, were, were to fail. If you Google ice dams, it'll tell you in the US alone, there are 15 deaths per year related to ice dams. And here's a schematic. Um, heavy snow um, in on the top leading to dammed water when it melts and then an ice dam downstream. Now that's a little bit deceiving because when you look up and Google ice dam, this is what you'll actually find. These are the most dangerous ice dams uh, on the planet at the moment in terms of loss of life. Uh, but the concept is the same. Uh, basically, if you melt the water and there's an ice dam um, and then uh, you get some failures going downstream, it can uh, can result in fatalities. Um, this, in this case, a different kind. So instead of Google ice dams, we need to Google uh, a term that we all like to say, GLOF. Uh, what the GLOF, uh, what is a GLOF, and where would you find one? So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, one of the uh, natural dams we'll be talking about today, a glacial lake outburst flood. Now, those can be formed a number of different ways. Um, ice or rock avalanches can form them. Uh, the moraine dam can collapse. You can wash out the fine materials and just pipe right through it. Um, there could be earthquakes or high upstream inflows. Um, that can all lead to a GLOF event. We also have volcanic dams or lahar dams. Um, Spirit Lake uh, is one that has formed and reformed a number of times over the years. The Tootle River downstream um, has also been impeded a number of times by various uh, volcanic activity uh, and some of the flows um, that then cause some catastrophic effects when water dams up behind it and then fails the obstruction. Alluvial fans are not quite as big a deal. We won't address these at all today. Um, but technically, um, an alluvial fan, a fan blocks its own path. The river comes out and, or the creek system comes out and blocks its own path because it no longer has the capacity to move the sediment. So those can form small uh, impediments, but it's got room to move. And so it's um, inconvenient and it does cause some infrastructure issues, um, but these are not the catastrophic kind of events that we are actually going to be talking about today. I will also probably won't uh, mention much about um, the a, another kind of landslide that uh, when you build a dam, you might increase the risk of a landslide into that dam and cause the dam to fail. Um, even one of the uh, worst dam failures we've had was a dam that stayed in place and just failed to contain the water from the wave that, uh, uh, from, a, from a landslide that fell into it um, up in Northern Italy uh, from on the Swiss border. And so, and these kind of waves that we're talking about um, can be massive. There's some debate about this one, I think, in, in Alaska and how high that might have been. But uh, you know, looking at the the scale of things, you know, 500 meters high, uh, that's that's just astronomical. So these geological events can just really um, blow your mind. But let's go back in geological time um, as we prep for uh, Chris's presentation here. Prehistoric dam failures. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Lake Bonneville, Lake uh, Corcoran, um, which is also known as uh, Lake Clyde. Uh, and then Chris will talk about Glacial Lake Missoula. And I also was going to hit one, uh, one, one additional one as well. But uh, let me just uh, have a look here at this one in the Central Valley. And this is going way back in geological time. And, you know, the terrain looked nothing like it does today. But if we did fill up the Central Valley and just put a little tiny block in there at Vallejo, 
this is uh, essentially what happened with this lake, um, and then uh, as it as it spilled um, out into the Pacific, it carved out uh, a bit more of the canyon there um, and in the Straits. Um, and so that's that's kind of a, a cool little uh, you know uh, thing to think about. If you just dam it up right there, you'll be able to uh, basically f flood the whole Central Valley uh, just with that little stretch. And then um, when you when you see that um, coming around uh, in in the Central Valley, this is just pulled into a um, th this is a grass model that we did um, of the of, of the Central Valley Lake there and, and and watching it watching it drain you can just imagine the forces uh, involved I think it was in place for maybe a hundred thousand years or something so uh, it, it, uh, it, it it's got some pretty significant uh, geological implications when you uh, release that kind of volume of water likewise um, where I went to, to school in the mid in the in the west in the U.S., we used to see the benches on the side um, from all the different levels of Lake Bonneville. So I've modeled this one here in Hickaraz as well, and watched that flood out into the Columbia. Chris will show you some more details on the Columbia Gorge, and there's the Willamette uh, Valley there um, from the Missoula floods. But that's something that that you can see some evidence of uh, today um, around the shores of Lake Bonneville. You can see, I think, um, going into the Snake Snake River there through that pass you can watch as the different levels come up and this is what today's terrain but as this uh, comes up in floods um, you can imagine the volume of water that would have been released to lower that lake by you know 100 meters or something on the on the levels um, it's just astronomical when you think about the uh, the implications of that and then we have oh exaggerated mount hood there and there's the willamette valley uh, and so again here's lake bonneville um, and if you look along the sides of the mountains uh, mountain ranges there People used to look at these uh, before they understood what had gone on and think there's no way that could be a natural feature. So you'd see some of these benches out there and they're all at the same level. And so some people thought, oh, some ancient civilization must have uh, created these. So there's actually this thing called the dream mine where people thought, oh, some ancient civilizations must have buried some a treasure there. And it's still ongoing today without that understanding. Just across the valley there, um, this is something we visited in a field trip for a geology class I had uh, in college. Uh, the university days, uh, Thistle, Utah, which uh, was buried by a landslide dam, and they ended up having to reroute the railway through it. And you see those tunnels there. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit. But getting back to geological time, well, there's there's uh, <laughs> Thistle, Utah, and some of the houses that are uh, currently buried. And look at how big that landslide dam is, and where the railroad was, and where the new uh, diversion tunnel is to prevent a catastrophe in the future. So um, I also wanted to show you here in Lake Constance in Europe, uh, one of the reasons I'm mentioning this one as well is because we've just had some massive events in the Rhine River. But can you imagine, you know, looking at that flooding that we had that was so catastrophic a couple of weeks back, um, I was actually uh, teaching a course where we were modeling the Rhine River as the Google warnings were the warnings were coming up in uh, on Google Maps for where the floods were happening um, while we were modeling this. So one of the things that we did in that uh, course as well is to just see what happens if you take Lake Constance and then uh, form a uh, just that little tiny gap that you see right there. Um, if you just block that up, um, you can actually get, uh, you know, flood a good chunk of Germany. You can do the same thing over here by Dresden as well. Um, and so a lot of these things have been lakes in the past. And when they have uh, failed catastrophically, like here in Lake Constance, you can see um, the Flims Rock slide, which is just upstream. Um, you can see the, the, the water course here and see how prone this is to landslides blocking it. Um, that's something that I think is, um, you know, is, is something that we'll want to uh, uh, ex explore a little more um, in, in the future, but it's not really something that, uh, that we can, you know, uh, predict with any degree of certainty, especially when these things are uh, earthquake induced. Now, um, what I'm going to do here when we're talking about geological times, these all happened in the last, you know, about 10,000 years, uh, Lake Bonneville and this, uh, the ones here in the Rhine. Um, uh, likewise, I think the Missoula floods are, you know, within the last, uh, you know, but prior to, to, to historical time, so we'll still call it prehistoric. Um, I'm going to take a break from my presentation here and turn it over to Chris because I wanted to um, address, uh, have him address a couple of things on the Missoula floods. He's got a really cool model and um, I've got a link to a presentation that he's done on, uh, on that website that I've shared with you. So I'm going to drop off here, stop my video and go onto the chat line while Chris takes over. So I can see your screen just fine, Chris. Over to you. 
Great. Thanks, Cray. Yeah. So Cray briefly touched on uh, uh, one of his many examples that he just gave, the uh, Missoula floods. And uh, this is something that has shaped the area where I live geologically um, a great deal. And in fact, even today, we can still see and we can feel the impacts of the series of floods that happened. And these were gloffs in the true sense of the word, uh, glacial lake outburst floods. But these were um, not only prehistoric, but on a enormous scale. So it's pretty fun to talk about. There's a lot of uh, uh, cool, interesting features and, and facts that I want to get into. And then I'm going to show you a little bit about my efforts modeling this flood in Hecraz. So just to give you some context of what we're talking about and where we're talking about, up in the northwest section of the U.S., we have the states of Washington right here, Oregon. I live here in Portland. Cray used to live here too, by the way. And uh, we've got Idaho over here and then Montana on the side. And during the late glacial maxims, this was about 10 to 40,000 years ago, much of the northern portions of Washington, Idaho, and Montana were covered with glaciers. And they would advance and retreat and advance and retreat over this time period. And at times, they would advance far enough south to block some major rivers, in this case, the Clark Fork River, which flows through uh, Missoula, Montana, and uh, eventually makes its way to the Columbia River today. Um, but at this time, when the glaciers advanced far enough, it would form an ice dam and block the entire Clark Fork River. With nowhere else to go, lots of high mountains around here, no other outlets, it just filled up and filled up and filled up. Ultimately, the lake caught up to the ice dam height. So the ice dam was building and advancing uh, at a faster rate than this could fill up. But eventually, the water filled up to about 90% of the height of the ice dam. And since uh, ice is about 90% uh, less dense than water, it would literally float this entire dam. Water would seep underneath, burst out. The whole thing would break apart and it would flood most of Eastern Washington and the entire Columbia River Gorge, the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and then ultimately out to the Pacific Ocean. And so this is an artist's rendition of the, the flood path of one of many Lake Missoula floods. Some people theorize there are up to as many as 40 different floods in this period between 10 and 40,000 years ago. Uh, each one flooded a little bit differently but more or less, this is what it looked like. They were very dynamic, extremely dynamic. Here you can see a little bit better, the inundation zone. This is Glacial Lake Missoula over here, and here's the flood path. And uh, again, with no outlet available where this ice dam formed or in this lake anywhere, uh, eventually it just burst the dam, the ice dam, and, and caused this flood. This is a close-up view here. This is what we call the panhandle of Idaho, this little section of Idaho right here that sticks straight up towards the border with Canada. And currently, there's a lake here called Lake Ponderé. And that lake, in fact, was formed by the uh, floodwaters coming out of the ice dam when it failed. And so here's the lake, Glacial Lake Missoula. This is the city of Spokane in eastern Washington. And this is uh, a portion of my model that shows what happened <clears throat> right here. So here's the ice dam. Here's Lake Ponderé. There's Spokane. And uh, when you run the model, you can see looking at down here, the scale, this is in meters per second. So uh, once it gets going, you'll see that we've got some really high velocities in areas, which explains a lot of the scouring that you see even today in eastern Washington that I'm going to show you in a, a few slides from now. This is a shot up here on the upper right of what used to be underwater when the lake was there, when Glacial Lake Missoula was there. It was as much as 660 meters deep at the ice dam. That's the same as Crater Lake in southern Oregon. Uh, the surface area was 7,500 square kilometers, but the volume was really large, 2,084 kilometers cubed. That's about half of present-day Lake Michigan or Lake Erie and Lake Ontario combined. So if you know anything about the Great Lakes of North America, uh, you understand that's a lot of volume. And uh, Cray was talking about the benches around the Salt Lake City area that you can see just driving around. They have the same feature in Missoula, Montana. 
if you ever get out to um, Western Montana, you can see these perfectly horizontal lines that were all put there by the lake bed, the Glacial Lake Missoula lake bed at different elevations. And for the longest time, it was a mystery. People didn't know how they got there and how they could be so perfectly horizontal. Uh, but now we know. A lot of other mysteries that have since been solved, but for the longest time when people were exploring this area, um, it was really unknown how they got there. One good example is Dry Falls and also in Eastern Washington. And uh, this happens to be a dry waterfall that's five kilometers wide. That's five times wider than Niagara Falls and it's twice as high, but there's nothing more than a little trickle of water, even during a, a rainstorm coming into here. So there was a lot of head scratching about what, what actually caused this. There's no real river big enough that could cause that. In fact, um, if you just do some basic hydraulic measurements here, it looks like there was about 10 times the volume of all the rivers in the world flowing over dry falls here in the, uh, the peak of the event. And you can see dry falls in the bottom left right here. This is a present day reservoir that's been dammed up. But even still, you can see all the scarring if you look cl closely. And this is just simply from Google Earth zoomed in. You can see the scarring in this uh, landscape here. It's very dry, which is, is nice when studying this because there's no vegetation to cover up um, all the evidence of this flood out there. Here's a closer view of the scarring and dry falls right here and some other remnant lakes left behind. And this is a uh, just a screenshot of my model flowing through that area. Another really interesting feature are the giant ripples. Now, we've all seen this at the beach. When the water recedes, you see these little ripples in the sand that form, or you might even see them in a sand bed stream if the water's shallow enough or you could, it's clear enough that you could see through it. But here's an example of giant ripples, enormous ripples that were formed by the glacial Lake Missoula floods that you can even see today in Google Earth. If you zoom in close enough, this is called West Bar. It's on the Columbia River. And here's a, uh, another view of that closer in. And you can see this little boat here for size context, for scaling. You can see the size of these giant ripples. Um, in fact, if you were standing on those, you wouldn't even know, really. They just look like rolling hills. But from a distance or from an aerial image, you can see they look exactly like the same kind of ripples you see in rivers or on the beach. There's West Bar over there again. Couple other really interesting features carved out by the flood right here. You can see some remnant lakes, a lot of scarring, a lot of drops, natural drops or dry uh, falls here. And so this was an interesting part of my model where you could see the, the funneling of water and the concentration of flow that increased the velocity really high uh, up above uh, 50 meters per second through here to do all of this um, geologic damage here, so to speak. And here, in fact, it's kind of interesting. The water actually, for a period of this run, actually went upstream on the Columbia River uh, for a little bit before it reversed course to go back downstream. The Columbia River Gorge is another really great um, and interesting feature, remnant of the Missoula floods. I, I don't want to say it was formed by the Missoula floods, but certainly uh, the floods added to the character, and you can see a lot of the flood scarring here, um, especially in the eastern side of the gorge where it's much drier than on the west where it's a uh, rainforest. Uh, so you can still see the scarring, the benching that's taken place here, and some of the, uh, the talus and landslides that happen. So this is an artist's rendering of what this flood may have looked like from this view right here uh, coming down the Columbia River Gorge. Probably my favorite part of the Missoula floods is the uh, ice rapted erratics. And so as you can imagine with this dam failed, it sent lots of chunks of ice or in other words, icebergs down with the flood. Well, as these glaciers advanced down into North America or into the United States, um, present day United States, it would entrain these large rocks and boulders into the glacier. And so when the ice dam failed, it wasn't just ice, but it was a mix of ice and rocks. And so some of these icebergs would float uh, as far as um, the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and once they, the, uh, the floodwaters receded, these icebergs would um, rest out on dry land and eventually melt and leave behind these rocks. And this is a, a, a great example of an ice rafted erratic that's uh, near where I live. It's, it's called the Bellevue erratic, and you can hike up to it like this gentleman has and, and walk around it. Um, but they're all over the place. They're all over the flood path. 
And especially in dry areas or areas with little vegetation, you can find these erratics. Here's some more examples. This is a giant one off of a highway and a few others scattered around. And you can see this one in Google Earth right here. Just zoom in close enough so you can see them all over the place. The farmers out there, they just till their fields right around these rocks. They don't even try to bother to uh, remove them. They're too big. In fact, here's a good example of someone building a, or um, growing a vineyard and just uh, constructing it right around this erratic that's in the middle of the field. And there's, there's another one with uh, a bunch of kids on it uh, for context on size. But getting into the concept of dam breach modeling, because this is really what got me interested in the Missoula floods is um, I do dam breach modeling a lot and I mostly use HECRAS, but there are several other models out there that can do the same thing. But um, I got very interested in the Missoula floods because it's a dam breach model of epic proportions and one that's um, historic, prehistoric and has a lot of impact on my area. But dam breach modeling is really important for dam safety programs. And that's that's why we study it. But it has been applied and is being applied to modern day gloss. The Himalayas are a great example of where people are doing gloss modeling. And uh, they can be quite destructive. Getting into my 2D model real quick before I turn it back over to Cray, I just wanted to show you a little bit about the, the 2D model. And more it was a curiosity on my part. It wasn't an actual funded project, but a curiosity on my part as to, hey, can this be done in heck raz? So I simply got myself a terrain, like all of these really cool um, fantasy models that Cray puts together, where he just gets free terrain data off of the web and builds a 2D model off of it. That's essentially what I did here too. And you can see my, uh, my 2D areas, my 2D meshes. I have two of them, one representing Glacial Lake Missoula upstream of the ice dam, and then one representing the downstream routing reach. That allowed me to start this one really deep, this 2D area and this 2D area dry. And, um, and then, you know, there's a little bit of work to put into it, but not a whole lot. It was fairly easy to put together, uh, especially having a lot of uh, geologic papers out there on this event. You can use that as a guide. But from the record, in fact, the, the Lake Missoula depth, I mentioned this already, but it was 660 meters deep. So extremely deep, 11 million cubic meters per second at the peak of any of these many floods that happened. That is for context, 50 Amazon rivers or 10 times all of the rivers in the world combined under their base flows. So a large flood, 50 to 80 kilometers per hour velocity. So if you want to put it in uh, driving terms, um, not like race car fast, but certainly faster than you're going to run. Uh, floodwaters reached as far upstream as the Willamette Valley um, in um, up to Eugene, Oregon, home of Nike, by the way. So here's a, uh, um, a geologist rendition of what the flood path looked like. So this was served as my guide and also my uh, calibration tool. And so here's my result right here. You can see it looks pretty close. This is uh, Eugene, Oregon down here. So the floodwaters came all the way down, all the way up the Willamette Valley, filled this all in. We have great agriculture in here as a result. So I always tell people that... Um, Eastern Washington's loss is our gain down here in the Willamette Valley because we've got great agriculture out here and this is what they call the scablands today. So um, this is the extent and um, here's an animation and I'll let this run for a little bit. I don't know, Cray, if there are any questions while it's running we could uh, address before I move on to the final few slides. Just while that's running, uh, just one thing I wanted to mention is that, you know, we're talking about natural dam uh, failures. And in some cases, like what we've got here, you know, the ice has, you know, there's so much hydrostatic pressure on the ice itself um, that, that it finds flow paths and it can actually melt some of the ice just from uh, what's going on subsurface under that kind of pressure. Um, and then, and then it fails. That's an obstruction that comes into play, you know, from the ice or, you know, we talked about landslide dams coming in from a landslide, but some of these events are, it, it was just the lake shore, like uh, the, the, the Lake Bonneville, it, it was just a lake, it was just sitting there and it was draining out. And at some point though, it started draining out so much that it scoured out and head cut through the channel it was uh, outletting from. And so it wasn't really blocked by a landslide or an ice dam. So I guess um, maybe just wanted to talk about um, a, a couple of the questions that have come in. Uh, and maybe if Chris, if you can just address Address what what happens to form an ice you know when an ice dam breaches because we do want to talk about 
you know, the risks to populations that are sitting downstream of potential ice dams. You know, what is physically going to happen under that pressure to cause that to burst? And then uh, just one quick question. Um, was there also a weather event? Um, somebody's asking the question, was it like a 100-year ARI or a PMP? Or what is it that you were modeling? Was it just a static water level and you burst it? Or did you apply any meteorological conditions to it? So those two questions for you. Yeah, so I'm no expert on the, uh, the mechanics of an ice dam failure. As I understand it in reading, doing a little research on this, setting up this model that uh, the theory, the, the prevalent theory anyway, for the Lake Missoula event was that the ice dam actually floated. So once the water got high enough, ice is um, you know less dense than water, it actually floats in water. And so when the water got high enough, it, it literally lifted the entire ice dam up that part of the glacier and it was able to seep underneath. And once that happened, then it, you know, the pressure and the, and the force and the sheer stress of the water moving underneath just broke the entire thing up and, and off it went. I suppose that there's a possibility that it, uh, it may have overtopped as well, but uh, the, the floating theory is what I hear the most of. Uh, as far as like your typical present day that you might fi find in mountains, present day glaciers, uh, you know, I hear things like, um, crevasses filling up with water and then the water pressure just gets too much for it to handle and it just ultimately breaks. Uh, but again, I'm no expert on that. As far as the um, any storm event, so I, this simulation would be what you would call a sunny day uh, event yeah. in, in that there was no hydrologic event associated with it. It was just simply base flow filling up the Clark Fork to a point where it ultimately just was too much for the ice dam to handle and it failed. So it wasn't the 100 year um, event. It wasn't a PMP or PMF. It was a sunny day. Now the resulting flood is greater than any PMF you would ever get or, or measure or, or um, estimate today in the area. Um, but um, as far as this modeling, went, it wasn't an actual flood, flood induced by a meteorologic event. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Okay, and th there's a few other questions uh, coming up. Um, do you have any other slides? Uh, yeah, let me quickly. I just want to quickly go because this this um, this webinar is is also on uh, uh, yes. landslide dams, and so this red square kind of is a nice segue into a very interesting landslide dam we have we had in the Columbia River Gorge about a thousand roughly plus or minus years ago, and it formed a a natural landslide dam. And you can still see the landslide deposits today. Um, this is the Columbia River right here. Uh, today we have uh, Bonneville Dam here, which you see the, um, the two spillways in the powerhouse in the middle, which forms this reservoir. But uh, when this was free flowing, we had a, uh, a landslide here. And this was before European settlement of the area, but certainly Native Americans lived here, and, and there is Native American oral history on this event that happened. And so um, it was roughly 500 to 1500 years ago. There's still debate on that, but you can see how this landslide pushed material in and actually blocked the entire Columbia River. Um, and the water pressure behind this natural dam eventually burst a hole through the landslide dam. At least that's one theory. Some people think it ultimately overtopped, but um, I think it actually punched through like a piping failure. And because the, the oral tradition, the oral history from Native Americans talk about a bridge, in fact, they called it the bridge of the gods. And so they had this natural bridge that they would use to cross the Columbia River. And uh, that natural dam before it became a bridge was 61 meters high, roughly, and it formed a lake 56 kilometers long, which a lot of this area was forested back then, and it drowned out a lot of forests. And, and in fact, well, here, before I get to that, this is the escarpment that you can see uh, from the landslide. It's still uh, visible today. If you drive up the Columbia River, River Gorge, you can clearly see where this landslide originated. And this is the deposit here in the foreground before the river. But here's a, um, I can't tell if this is a, a just an old timey photo or a drawing, but this uh, shows some of the ancient uh, drowned out forests that uh, left behind these tree stumps. And then when Bonneville Dam was constructed, they, they were drowned out. So you can't see these today, but you used to be able to see those before Bonneville Dam. And then I just wanna conclude this with uh, first a, an artist's rendition of the Bridge of the Gods, 
when it was the natural bridge of the gods that Native Americans used here. Um, and you can see the Columbia River flowing underneath. And here's the actual bridge to the other side, which is present day Washington. So from this same perspective, if you go out here today, you can see the current bridge of the gods. So an actual real constructed bridge <laughs> is sitting there today where the old natural bridge was. And so with that, Cray, uh, I will turn it back to you. Sounds good. Okay. Um, a few questions coming in about your model. Um, so if you can uh, have a look at those on the Q&A line, keep those questions coming. We'll try and leave a few minutes at the end. Um, so I think Chris hit a few of those questions just now, but thanks for that, Chris. That was, um, I, I saw that presentation a while back, a longer version of it, and was absolutely fascinated by the uh, signs that we can look for. Um, so now we're into recorded history. Um, so if you can uh, see this here with uh, the, the example in China back in, uh, actually in pre-recorded history, there, there, are, there is evidence um, of, from about 2000 years ago um, of one of the biggest landslide dams ever failing and probably had a massive loss of life, but we have no record of it. Um, in 1786, there was another one which resulted in, uh, I think about 100,000 deaths. They said over 100,000 deaths that is in recorded history. Um, and then later on in China, um, as well. In 1933, there was another one that I think um, had about 2,500 deaths associated with it. So uh, quite catastrophic um, for these uh, for these events, you know, and so the question is, uh, could it happen again? Well, let's look at New Zealand just recently, a couple of years ago, um, in 2016, an earthquake uh, set off a bunch of landslides, um, approximately 200 of which um, formed dams behind them. And those have been monitored and it gives um, geologists and civil engineers and modelers, uh, just a, a playground of tools to use. If you go to the website slide nz or nz.net, um, you'll see some examples there of what sort of research is going on. And um, you'll see you know, how they pinpointed uh, where the landslides were and then um, did aerial surveys and went out with remote sensing to try and figure out what was happening. Um, and some of these um, were absolutely massive. Um, this, this lake you can't even see here because the dam is so big, It'll just jutting around the corner there. But some of these things um, have, have given us a laboratory is what they've said uh, uh, on, on the website. There is a laboratory there that's full scale for us to, to analyze. So um, some of these dams that formed had to be analyzed um, and very quickly. So I wanted to talk Talk briefly about dam breach modeling parameters. If you're going to model these things um, to help save lives and send out the early warnings, you know, if we know something like this is coming, uh, what do we do? Uh, if you watch a typical dam breach model uh, come down, it breaches very quickly. Some landslide dams never breach because they're always just seeping through. Some of them armor up and just uh, you know stay stabilized for uh, many many days or years or weeks. Uh, it's it's very there's very high uncertainty with uh, how long a landslide dam will be in place, and so you might need to model a whole bunch of different scenarios. I think the ones that formed after that earthquake in 2016, um, I think they said approximately half of them failed <laughs> within the first day. Uh, they were already gone. And so not enough time to even accumulate much water behind them. But a couple of things we need to consider then when we're looking at modeling uh, dam breaches. And thanks for all those questions. There are a bunch of questions on the chat line um, for, that Chris will be answering about um, what breach methods uh, should be used and things like that. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to just highlight is that, you know, if we have the data already in landslide susceptible areas where there is a risk of damming up the rivers, you know, we could already be going about uh, collecting the existing terrain data. And then as soon as a dam, landslide dam forms, you know, if we put get the level as quickly as we can from, you know, drones or a helicopter survey, you know, find some points, um, get up there and try and find out how, how big that landslide dam is that is formed, um, that can be quickly entered into a terrain, uh, into the terrain data. We would also, though, need the hydrological data. We need to know what's going on at the time for, uh, you know, how long is it going to take this landslide dam to fill up and spill over? Um, so you would need some of that. And that can be you know, collected in advance so that you can have even simulations and predictions uh, and forecasts uh, available to you. 
And you would also need some geotechnical data about uh, what sort of material has um, slumped and blocked the river um, in order to establish some of your breach parameters. Population and infrastructure data, you know, where are your centers downstream? What is crucial to protect? You know, so these are all the, uh, you know, some of the things that we would need to put into the input. And then once we're running the model, one of the things that's critical um, now that we're running more and more detailed models with massive sets of LIDAR, you know, sometimes I'll hit run and I don't get results for a week or two on my models because they're just running and running and running. Well, when a landslide dam is formed, sometimes you need results that day. And so you may need to look at uh, the approach, you know, what, what equation sets are you using? Are you going to do a 1D versus a 2D? How big should the grid size be? Um, what's your time step? What's your runtime? Um, you know, and the grid size and the time step will directly relate to the runtime. So you can't have a week of runtime if you need results that week, uh, you know, or that day. I mean, because this is the Australian Water School, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes, even though it's not a huge risk here, to explain that, you know, certain things have happened in Australia as well. When we're talking about landscape, slide dams or natural dams forming. Um, not a lot of uh, GLOF risk in Australia, obviously, um, but uh, potentially some landslide risk. We have Lake Elizabeth that formed um, and breached without anybody really noticing. Um, I think it breached down about 26 meters down, they say, um, and then formed where it currently sits and hasn't really caused anybody any issues. So it's just a wildlife park where you can go for a walk. Um, no fatalities, but it is a landslide dam that has formed in Australia. We we have had dam failures in Australia that have been fatal. Um, the Cascade Dam in Tasmania um, was sent a massive plume of water down and, and was almost a debris flow because of how much, uh, how much wood it picked up along the way. Um, that was a fatal uh, dam failure incident, but not necessarily related to landslides. So when we look at landslide dam failure risk in Australia, we have had landslides in Australia and we have had dam failures in Australia. And we have had fatalities from landslides and fatalities from dam failures. We've also had landslide dam failures as well. But we've never yet, I don't think, as far as I can tell in the literature review that I've done, um, had all three of those put together. Could it happen? Potentially. Um, and it's probably you know worth considering. But I think the biggest risk uh, for landslide dams forming and breaching uh, in Australia is probably related to the mining sector. When waste rock dumps go in next to rivers or tailings dams are put in on tributaries that um, you know could end up failing and blocking water courses, that's probably the <laughs> largest risk in Australia um, at the moment um, for natural dam failures. Worldwide, though, looking at today and looking at some of the risks, um, you know, there have been some catastrophic events um, related to landslide dams. And you can see this one here in Nepal um, that has blocked that river. And, um, you know, again, when these things come downstream, they can take lives. And it's, uh, it, it can be very tragic, um, especially when there's not much warning. Um, we saw one uh, just recently, just this year um, in India that was initially called a GLOF. Um, this, uh, this one, uh, all the papers, I think, initially for the first couple of days uh, said it was a glacial lake outburst flood. And I wanted to relate this back to what Chris was talking about with the ice dam on, uh, for, for Lake Missoula. Um, this is one, I mean, man, when you look at this, think about as a modeler, I mean, aside from the human tragedy here, um, think about as a modeler, uh, you know, uh, can we actually represent this kind of flow? Uh, and how would you do it? What are the roughness coefficients? What are the turbulence uh, parameters that you would put in for a flow like this? You know, because we want to predict, um, you know, who needs to evacuate and, uh, you know, get the early warnings out there. So our models need to be up and ready to go. Um, this is not good quality on the image, but I wanted to show you how quick things can happen. So here comes the water through this, um, the, this, this spillway, through this, the sluice gate there. Um, turns away the, I don't think there's a glip, uh, uh, any, any pause in the recording here. Um, the next time we go up to that uh, spillway, the, uh, the, uh, the, the gate, see that gate just moving right along the way there? Uh, I mean, the, the forces involved in these kinds of failures, again, as Chris said, the, these are greater than any uh, PMF kind of events. Um, this is something that, that you don't necessarily design for, uh, but maybe we should just be keeping things out of the way. Um, if you go back uh, on 
YouTube on the, the Australian Water School's YouTube channel, um, Dr. Sharitha um, in number 73 of our uh, Australian Water School webinars, uh, discusses the risk of GLOF and, and, and explains a bit about GLOFs in the Himalayas and the risks that climate change uh, poses to that. And as Chris mentioned, um, you know, climate change may increase things uh, in the future and increase that risk um, briefly um, for, you know, decades perhaps, uh, but in the end, it might reduce it. So what do we what do we do in the meantime? You know, can, how can we mitigate for that? While the world tries to cope with climate change, you know, we may or may not uh, we may or may not succeed in what we're trying to do. So do we just deal with these things happening? Uh, in the end, the uh, event that happened um, in uh, in India this year uh, ended up being, I think, a rock slide that came down into a glacial area. But the friction, um, the thought right now is that the friction from that rock slide heated things up enough to melt enough water to exacerbate this condition that was already bad because of the rock slide going into the uh, the ice dam. So certain things like that um, may continue to increase um, with uh, with climate change um, as more water melts and forms behind these uh, and, and these these liquid lakes form behind the ice uh, and you know potentially with an outburst flood that can result in a tremendous loss of life so mitigating sorry I've been showing these explosions for a while here repeating over and over again you know this is one in New Zealand where the dam formed and it was going to be a big risk so they just blocked it and blasted it and they've done that uh, in China just recently as well uh, a couple of events in 2010 and 2014 um, there was a lot of blasting going on just trying to block some of these or uh, clear some of these landslides. Um, another thing you can do is uh, on mitigation is to build a bypass, which in Spirit Lake, just to keep that level low and keep it from overtopping and catastrophically failing, um, the level is monitored and um, and controlled um, with the uh, with with some outflows. Right now, at the moment, there is a USGS uh, landslide database, and um, I've been told uh, over the last uh, few days that um, eventually um, a, a landslide dam likelihood index is going to get added to that. The work on the uh, Kakura earthquake as well in New Zealand has resulted in acceleration of getting a national landslide dam inventory put together with some forecast models. Now, that's just one area that's in New Zealand, but the technology and the, exp and, and the database that you get from that and the um, tools and the approaches that we can get from that can help uh, in other regions as well. And uh, this group ICMOD, um, as we'll call it, out of Nepal, um, they're monitoring very closely all the glacier, um, the glaciers and the climate change impacts and uh, what the risks are. And with, with a lot of recommendations to avoid some of these power stations going in, in some of the areas, um, and, and there were advanced warnings that uh, perhaps that's not the best place to put a power station. Um, because of those risks upstream. And as we, uh, th there are people who are continuing to monitor some of the landslide dams uh, in the, uh, from, from the Kaikoura earthquake. Now, those are just a few. Um, there are many others as well, but um, I'll mention this one in particular, uh, the one in New Zealand. Um, and what I wanted to point out down here is that statement that this, this earthquake provides a laboratory uh, to quantify post-earthquake landscape dynamics. Um, and the dynamics, you know, one of the dynamics being uh, the hydrodynamics of water filling behind these things, potentially failing that dam and sending a catastrophic wave downstream, which could lead to loss of life um, or infrastructure. This is uh, some of the research uh, that's going on. I will highlight this um, on uh, uh, when, I, when I pull up the website uh, here momentarily. Um, do keep those questions coming. Um, and what I'm going to do here is uh, just briefly before we go into the Q&A back with Chris is um, scroll through this, uh, the, the resources here and pull this up and show you what we've got so far. This is something I'm going to keep live and keep uh, keep linking to. Um, if you have resources that you would like to submit, that you'd like to see included here, um, I'll just scroll down here and show you what's on here right now. We have got, again, this presentation that was done for the Australian Water School uh, by Aaron, um, who did a great job in explaining GLOFs and the risk um, to populations and how climate change leads to that. A more extensive version of Chris's presentation, um, if you were as fascinated with that as I was. This all relates to geomorphology and I've, I've timestamped these to the part where we get into paleo flood hydrology. And uh, that, that's something where, you know, if you want to recreate these things um, and see how much flow there was, you got to look at the signs and then um, 
undertake paleo flood hydrology to get uh, the numbers out of it. Why um, extreme events are expected to intensify, even in areas where annual rainfall is decreasing, is explained very well in this uh, webinar by some expert presenters from uh, CSIRO. Then we have the rivers on Mars, which I like to see some sediment transport webinars uh, that, that, that discuss um, you know, how material moves because a lot of this is debris flow. When we get these kind of events, it turns into debris flow. And then we have a course coming up um, in sediment transport modeling where you can mo model mobile boundaries. Um, this is, uh, I, I do want to show you this one. We've, we're, we're running a bit short on time, but you've got to see this. This is one of the coolest things I've uh, ever seen. Um, this one right here, um, when we go into the full screen on this one, um, if I, it, th this is on the uh, GNS website, I believe. Um, and, and they've got this model and you can move this around yourself. Okay, so I'm just moving this live on the fly right now. And you can see this landslide dam up here with this lake, which used to be a lot bigger. And you can scroll through and this is a great, I, I would just recommend everybody just go through this one. Um, go onto that, that website and uh, put it onto full screen because this is just awesome. And it'll, it'll uh, you, it's, it's like you're, you're flying through it yourself in, in a drone and it, it'll discuss um, some of these things and where some of the sediment came from, um, where the dam phase collapsed. Um, there's the landslide dammed lake um, where the lake uh, was infilling. And then you can see right here, the incision and I'll go back up here to where the aggradation is happening. And then the river avulsion, we talked about that and, and as part of the dynamics, uh, the continued landsliding. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But again, I just thought that was really cool. Now I've got about 20 different reports here that we've covered, um, you know, that, that we've kind of discussed on these different things like Lake Bonneville, uh, a lot of USGS papers um, on these global events around the world. They've documented a bunch of these that we couldn't cover today, some in Switzerland, some in Nepal. We've got Mount St. Helens here, a bunch of just articles um, about climate change and how that's going to affect uh, the risk of gloffs. This Flims rock slide that I showed you, how the Rhine was uh, part of partially carved out by some of these landslide failures. And then those events in China, which were so astronomically uh, tragic in terms of the loss of life. And then a few more links here at the bottom. Uh, with that, uh, again, I'm just trying to put all those resources together for you because we don't have time in a one hour webinar to, uh, to get into all the really cool details about what's going on and the really scary details about what's going to happen if we do nothing. So with that, um, Chris, if you can come back on, I want to just find out um, if you've answered any questions that have been upvoted uh, that you wanted to highlight now before we close. Yeah, so there were several that I was able to get through. Uh, one I wanted to, to throw out here, see if you had any input on Tirtha Raj wants to know, how do you estimate the volume of landslide materials? And I wish I could, I could be a, geolo a geologist or a geotech as well as a hydraulic engineer, but uh, I only have so much schooling behind me. So I, you know, <laughs> I, that would be my first thing is I would, I would go uh, talk to my favorite uh, geologist and find out how they would uh, estimate the landslide materials. I don't know, Craig, if you have any opinion on that. Boy, these days, I mean, I've got people who can get up the next day sometimes with a drone and get me a LIDAR surface. So if I can just do a plus, you know, a raster calculator on the LIDAR, that's my preference. Um, that's not always yeah, available, sure. but um, if you get a couple of dimensions off of it, you could uh, maybe do some math. But I, you know, knowing where it came from and all that, I, I've got to, you know, fess up as well. I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm an expert at certain pieces of hydraulic modeling, but I am not a expert at, uh, by any means, um, at geo geology or geotech and things like that. Like that so um but we can i'm certainly in touch with people who could answer some of those questions in more detail and what we usually do with these is we'll take these q a's and um put any additional answers we can into this and then provide those as resources as well so do keep those questions coming anything else chris that you hit yeah another one that i i don't really know the answer to but what time type, type of real-time monitor monitoring might be able to be used in remote regions uh i don't do a lot of that in remote areas i wish i could that sounds fun but um, Cray, I don't know if you've run into that before. Yeah, it's 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 problematic, and that's one of the reasons why nobody knew what happened. Like um, in that that event that just happened this year, no nobody nobody knew what went on until they went back to satellite imagery, and so they can yeah. get um, you know you can you can get drones up in the air, you can get um, you know after the fact, but as far as what's going on right then. 
you know, telemeter data. There, there are there are gadgets out there that you can put out in remote areas, um, but you know, got to be linked into satellites. Um, and and that technology is is continually improving. I would refer you to the GNS website because they are real time monitoring um, some of these landslides and seeing you know if they're slipping any further and uh, what's going on with the lakes. Um, and so they've got some you know excellent staff on board who have been doing this since yeah, 2016 at least, so the last five years. Um, and so they've got a lot of experience in that. Any, any others before we close? Some nice compliments. I appreciate that. I'm sure Cray does too. Um, and all the folks at Australian Water School. Um, one last thing I'll, I'll just uh, bring up, Cray, before we conclude. Uh, there was a suggestion by Igor to maybe do a deeper dive on some of this, maybe get into more of the technical side of things and some of the principles and models used for doing this kind of modeling. So great suggestion, Igor. Thanks. So, sounds good. Yeah, if we can get um, the, the folks in New Zealand, especially um, who are doing, uh, who are uh, experimenting with this laboratory that uh, they've got this full scale lab, um, I'd love to have uh, them come on board and uh, and show us exactly what, the, what, what, what they've got. I think they're in the final phases of producing a database. And so maybe next year we'll have them uh, come on board and, uh, and present some of the results uh, of what they found. Because you know we can use this and apply it uh, elsewhere in areas where it hasn't been done before, and be ready for it. I mean, that's really the the take home message on this. You know, there's you can have models up and ready and ready to go in the high risk areas where all you've got to do. I mean, Chris, uh, you know how how quickly if you had a model that was up and running, and it, and you said, okay, block this here, <laughs> you know, and 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 breach this dam and show me how 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 uh, where the flood wave is going downstream. Uh, I mean, could you get an answer that day? And, yes. and how reliable would that answer be? I guess that's a question. Yeah, with, uh, with RAS today, Heck RAS, and many of the other software out there that does the same kind of thing, you can, uh, you can quickly set it up if you have a terrain, if you have terrain data to work with. Um, getting the terrain might be the, the yes. longest part of that process. Uh, once you have it, it's uh, very easy to throw some uh, 2D meshes on it, um, put in a couple boundary conditions, and press compute. Yeah. And uh, especially if you've got some experience behind you and you kind of know what pitfalls to look out for and avoid, uh, yeah, you can easily set this up. And, you know, something like what I showed, the Missoula floods, um, you know, honestly, after I had the terrain all put together, it was maybe a, a matter of an hour or two to do the initial run, maybe not even that long. And of course, yeah. you always want to tinker around with it afterwards and try and fine tune <laughs> it. But just to get something quick and easy, yeah, it's it's a pretty quick process. Yeah, and watch some of the um, uh, WBM's done some. Uh, they, they just did one a couple of weeks ago on one D versus two D, and you know, and 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 really demonstrated how uh, setting up that. Maybe, maybe uh, we'll close with that comment, uh, Chris. One uh, D versus two D. Um, compare the setup time when you initially, when I first saw that model, it was one D um, to your two D setup time. What what was the difference? <laughs> 1D was astronomically more difficult to set up. <laughs> yes. It took it took weeks to put that together and stabilize it. The 2D model, like I mentioned, once I had the terrain in there, it was a matter of not even two hours, maybe not even an hour before I had the model running. Um, so, yes. Yeah, it's a big, big difference. 2D is much easier. <laughs> sound, yeah, sounds yes. But good. it may take it may take a lot longer to run, but it is easier. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll stop it at that. Um, and yeah, again, just uh, some people think 1D is simple, 2D is more difficult because it sounds like it's a higher number or something. But no, uh, that's that's not the way it is. Um, okay. I will stop my share here, and we'll put up a couple of screens for everybody. Um, do fill out that feedback. Um, hope you've enjoyed this one uh, today. But let us know what you'd like to see more of, and uh, leave us with your feedback. And we'll, we'll try to get as many of these answers out to you as we can, the ones that we didn't get a chance to hit today. Uh, and you'll see a final slide as we leave here that shows us the um, courses that are coming up. Um, if you'd like to sign up for any of these and do this for yourself, breach some dams. Chris and I will both be um, uh, doing a dam breach course uh, in HECRAS uh, in September. And so, you know, maybe, maybe we'll breach a landslide dam just for fun uh, in the end on that one, um, just to tie it into this one. Also sediment transport. Um, and we've got a few other things coming up that are relevant to this topic. So thank you for tuning in today. Um, appreciate your, uh, your participation and your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Chris. We'll see you. Thanks, Cray. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below.
and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.